Good morning. Welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Brandon. Um, I'm our worship leader here, but today I get the opportunity and the privilege to preach and be able to share for, to, you, for, uh, to you from God's Word. And um, I'm just super excited to be here, first of all. Um, we're not really in a series right now, so I got to choose my own topic and really just had a, a message that God has laid on my heart. So I'm really glad to be able to, 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 be able to share that with you today. Um, second of all, today is my six-year anniversary. Yes. Um, I know it's no 24 years like Matt Duke last week, but you know what? I'm glad to have um, six years under my belt. And uh, this morning, my wife even got up super early to make me bacon and uh, biscuits, and it was just a super blessing. And she loves it when I talk about her from stage. So if you see her this morning... Um, just be thankful for her. I don't know. I'm just thankful for her. But uh, the, the third thing is we have these chairs up here, and I was really offended that Jason wouldn't sit in it during uh, the worship, and Caleb and Haley should be sitting up there right now, like old school Baptist churches, but they said no. So um, I thought it'd be cool to have a fire, and then Carl told me no on that. So it was just kind of a fail of a set design, but uh, one day, maybe, he said the sprinklers would go off, so Maybe. Uh, I would be in trouble if they did, though, so better safe than sorry. Um, anyway, just really, really glad to be here this morning. Um, I, we're we're going to talk about weariness today. If I'm just starting off like that, we're going to talk about weariness. I wanted to tell you a couple of stories about my own weariness. First was one, um, I, I had a specific memory. Now, I am uh, i don't really consider myself young anymore. Uh, I'm in my 30s, and I have students that were in my youth ministry that are already married now. It just makes me feel old, but there's still some memories. If, you know, it doesn't matter how old I get, I'm still going to have some specific memories that stick out in my mind. I'm going to share one with you this morning. It's from 2003. I was a sophomore in high school. It was a summer going into my junior year, and it was right about that time where some of your friends, they, they start to get their driver's license, right? And some of them start to get their own vehicles. And I hadn't quite turned 16 yet, but uh, my, my friend Tyler had his own vehicle. It was a Ford Ranger, all right? You know, the small truck. And this specific instance, they were super excited. Now, I'm not a super large guy, but I'm not a tiny guy either. You know, I'm six foot, 220. My friends are tiny. I'm talking like five foot nothing, 100 pounds, soaking wet. And they're in the front of this Ford Ranger, and I'm stuck in the extended cab, which is like, you know, like six inches of extra space with a, with a seat that flips out on the side. So you're like sitting like this the whole time. And they're laughing because the large guy's in the back. And um, so we, we're, I don't know, we we're at a Tory's house, and we were going to go to somewhere in town. I don't know. But basically, uh, Tyler who is known for being a little erratic. We're driving down the road, and uh, I don't know if my parents know this story, and they're here today, so sorry if you don't know this story. And uh, it worries parents everywhere, what happens when your kids turn 16. So we're driving down this dirt road, and all of a sudden, Tyler, who's driving, yells, Deer! And he pulls and yanks the steering wheel, and so we're fishtailing on this road, on this dirt road, and my life is flashing before my eyes. We're going left, we're going right. I think we're flipping. I don't really know what's going to happen. But I thought, you know what, 16 years, we're good, but here's how it goes. And uh, we finally come to crash in this little embankment on the side of the road. And I say crash, I mean, we just kind of hit it. We got out. Everyone was okay. We didn't flip. Um, there might have been just a little bit of damage to the truck. We we're pretty lucky. And we get out and we're like, oh, Looking around, now open fields, by the way. We're not talking wooded area. We're talking about open fields. We're like, Tyler, where's the deer? He's like, there was no deer. And uh, he just did that for the fun of it. We almost died because he thought it'd be fun. And I don't know, it's just like teenagers for you. You know, you, you turn 16, you do crazy things. And uh, that year, that, that's just one of those really fun, memorable experiences that I had. And that was one of the, the good memories of 2003. However, if I'm honest with you, 2003 was not an overall good year for me. You see, in Van Buren, which is where I, where I grew up, um, when you go from 9th grade to 10th grade, that's when high school started, 10th grade. And so for me, I grew up in church. Um, I was very active in our youth ministry. And I remember being a 9th grader going into 10th grade with some of these kids that were older than me in youth and looking up to these kids that would lead us in worship 
that would pray, that were involved, that were in Sunday school and all that kind of stuff. And realizing that the way they lived their life at church was not the way they lived their life at school. And it tore me up, if I'm honest with you. I, I, I remember sitting in, in band class. I was, a, I was in band. Um, I remember sitting there and a kid not just a couple of rows behind me who was, again, a very active part of our youth group. And not just there because, or at least what it seemed to me, not just there uh, because he had to be but was involved, was looking at pornography on his phone with some other friends. And I just remember being, like, torn. I, I didn't know what to do. And, and the reason is because, if I'm honest with you this morning, I yearned for acceptance. I yearned to have a place. And when you're in high school, if there's any students in here, you know this this morning, there's nothing worse than being an outcast and being by yourself. And so what did I do? I wish I could say that I did the right thing. I wish I could say that I stayed on the straight and the narrow path, uh, but I did not. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be um, friends with these people because I didn't want to be an outcast. So I just, I just began to live how they lived. I remember 10th grade was absolutely miserable. Um, I knew that I was sinning. I knew that I was not walking with Christ and that I was supposed to be. Um, I knew that I was doing wrong things, and it just wore on me day after day. I didn't even notice it at first, but it just continued to wear and to wear and to wear on me until I reached my breaking point that summer. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Do you know what it feels like to be weary? Whether it's from sin, whether it's from uh, something else in your life, where, where you're just tired. I mean, this is a very timely message. Many of us are just tired in 2020. We're tired of the pandemic. We're, we're tired of, of uh, joblessness for many. You know, like just, I think it was last week, we had 900,000 people in our country newly file for unemployment. 900,000. That's a lot of people hurting in our country. Not only that, but we, it's, it's a political season um, here in just a, f- a few weeks, we have an election coming up. I'm tired of it on Facebook. I'm tired of the hate. I'm tired of the, uh, the hyperbole. I'm tired of the whole thing, and I just want it to be done with, if I'm just honest with you this morning. I, do you all feel that? Are you all thinking that? Are you all feeling that with me this morning? Are you just tired for other reasons? You know what? Just because the, the pandemic is tough, you know what? When, when we have kids in school, whenever... Uh, whenever there's a case and they have to shut down a whole 7th and 8th grade, that leaves parents struggling to find care for their kids for two weeks. That's tough. I don't even have a kid in, in, uh, in that age range yet, but we've felt it a little bit at our house. It's tough. Anytime there's a, a tough time, it makes it even harder on marriages because marriage is hard enough as it is that when the world is falling apart around us, it just makes it even harder. And for students, I just feel sorry for you guys too that that, uh, that many of you, the experiences that you should be having in high school, in junior high, are, are being taken away from you because of this pandemic. It's just a tough time. Well, Jesus speaks to those who are broken and weary this morning. And we're talking about weariness. Open up your scripture to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to be reading out of the NASB this morning. And... Uh, It's okay if you want to use the phone. We're okay with that. Because God's word transcends ink on a paper. It is empowered by him himself. So, you know what? Use your phone. I use my phone all the time. Um, I'm currently part of the way through a, almost working our way toward the end of a a read-through of the Bible in a year. It's been great chronologically to read through it. Um, And so I just wanted to read just this verse real quick. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now we have to kind of understand just a little bit the audience that Jesus is speaking to. And what what I'm always going to do when I preach, I love context. I love knowing what Jesus meant whenever he said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And I love that about this church. We're always going to seek what Scripture says first and not what we want Scripture to say. So this morning, when Jesus talks about come 
to me all who are weary and heavy laden. You have to know that at the time the people were weary and heavy laden that he was preaching to, that he was ministering to, that he was leading. And so just to give you kind of a, a, a brief overview, like I said, um, I've been reading through the scripture, and if you've been doing that with us this year, that's awesome. Uh, but you'll, I hope that you have felt this. As you read through the Old Testament very quickly, you quickly feel the, the stress of the people. So just, um, just briefly, Jesus is speaking to these people, and all the way from the beginning, really. But you look at like different leaders. You look at even Moses when he were, whenever he was leading the people out of Egypt into the promised land. Um, God was fed up with the people. Time and time again, the people of Israel turned their back on a God who had, had miraculously saved them from the Egyptians, who had done great things in front of them for their own eyes to see. And yet, not just a few chapters later, they're making a new golden calf to a, another idol. Nation of Israel was always looking for the easy way out. And God on several occasions said, listen, we're just going to wipe the slate clean again. We're going to start o- over. But great men of God like Moses, like Joshua, like David would stand in the gap. They would lead the people back to God. They'd, Moses on several occasions pleaded with God not to do that, but to have mercy on his people, and God did. But you see, for hundreds, literally hundreds of years, this, it was this same equation. God acts on behalf of his people. He does something miraculous. They forget. They turn from him. They experience his wrath. They turn to him, and that whole cycle just starts over and over again. So much so that if you get to the end of the Old Testament, you realize God sends his people into exile for years. They're exiled from their homeland. Until again, God relents from his wrath. He has grace and mercy on his people, brings them back into their homeland. And when we finish up the Old Testament, we finally come back around to, uh, to people finally getting it. Listen, we have to follow God. I wish that the people had done the right thing, but instead what happened was instead of following God and remembering Um, that this was all about faith in the first place. This is all about relationship with our God. They turned their religion into what is called legalism. That is simply um, obeying the law over the relationship and over the, the real principle that was found in the Old Testament. Jesus said to the Pharisees on many occasions, go and think on this. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, quoting the Old Testament. So for about 400 years, the people had become so focused on the law that to them what righteousness meant, what it meant to be a good follower of God, is that you followed all of the rules in your life. So much so that the leaders said, you know what, it's not good enough just to follow the 613 laws that we have found in the Old Testament. In order for us to never break a law, we need to add even extra on top of that. So in Deuteronomy, for example... In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21, it says, You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so what the Pharisees did is to say, okay, you know what? To make sure we never break this law, we need to add a gate of law around it. So what they did is they said, we're never going to eat milk or have dairy in the same meal ever again. So like right now, if you go over to Israel right now and you go to McDonald's, which they have, um, you cannot order a cheeseburger. You cannot order a cheeseburger at McDonald's because you cannot have meat and cheese together in order not to break this law. You see what I'm kind of saying here? 613 laws was hard enough, but to add even more on top of that was absolutely um, backbreaking. And the people were weary. They were heavy laden because of the heaviness of the law that was on their shoulders. And Jesus knew this. On top of that, um, the, the people were weary because they were looking for a Messiah that would be a political and a military leader that would lead Israel back to independence. But they did not understand that the kingdom that Jesus was coming to set up was an everlasting kingdom that transcended the earth. And so many Jewish people missed out on the Messiah because they were burdened by the Roman rule. And they were looking for the Messiah. They were tired of paying the taxes. They were tired of having to obey governors. 
They wanted their own nation again. And the people were again weary and they were burdened. So when Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, he speaks to people that were indeed weary and heavy laden. Um, this morning, Jesus' words transcended. The, the first thing I would say to you, is, if you don't hear anything else this morning, is that no matter where we are in life, whether we're burdened by, by religiousness, by legalism in our own lives, whether we're burdened by 2020, social media, in our marriages, in our families, in our work, the first thing we need to understand is that we need to come to Jesus. If you struggle with feeling like you are not enough, then come to Jesus. If you feel like you can never do everything right, then come to Jesus. If you feel like you are unworthy of forgiveness, then come to Jesus. If you are tired and cannot see a way out of your situation, then come to Jesus. If you cannot find the contentment you are searching for, then come to Jesus. Simply this morning, first step, come to Jesus. Why? Because he is good. Why? Because he is full of grace. He is full of mercy. Why? Because he is the Son of God. Because he is worthy of our adoration. And because he can lead us to rest. Now, it sounds good there. Amen. We got the message. Let's go on. Go on throughout our week. Jesus does not end here. Yes, we should come to Jesus. But he goes on in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus doesn't just implore people to come to him because he's going to bring them freedom from the law. Jesus says, no, I'm the fulfillment of the law, and yes, we're going to take this yoke off of your shoulders, but... You have to take on my yoke. Maybe not what we all expected this morning. But to come to Jesus and to truly come to him means to be placed under his yoke, means to be discipled to Jesus. So if you grew up in church, you probably know what a yoke is. Your youth pastor, your pastor's talked about it plenty. But if you don't know what a yoke is, real simply and real quickly, a yoke it was just an attachment that went on the shoulders and was attached to an animal like an ox. And you would attach your plow to that yoke, and you would be able to do work effectively because your animal was yoked. And you could use the strength of that animal for, uh, for the benefit. And so Jesus said, in order to come to me, you must take on my yoke. But my yoke is better than the yoke that you have on currently because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is the yoke of Jesus? Yes, it has a moral aspect to it, but it's not only morality. Jesus did not come to set up another legalistic system. It has a relational aspect to it, but it's not only relational. It has a faith aspect to it. But what Jesus was saying was, come, follow me. Yes, obey my commands. Put on my yoke. But even more than that, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to even fulfill and to do what I'm calling you to do. The yoke of Jesus is better. I love that um, this quote I read from a commentary this week. It said, if Jesus is not offering a yoke of the law, neither is he offering freedom from all constraints. The yoke is Jesus' yoke, not the yoke of the law. Discipleship must be to him. I read that out of the expositor's commentary. And uh, I love this idea. Now, instead of the law, now we have the Holy Spirit. Now we have Jesus to lead us. Now we have a relationship with him. But it's not just relationship. It's following him. It's being obedient to his word and to his commands. Jesus said we have to become disciples of him. And lastly, he said that you will find rest in me. What does rest look like? Well, I think we have a pretty good idea. It means contentment found only in Christ. It means peace is found only in Christ. When we trust Jesus and give over our fears, worries, struggles, weariness, and shortcomings, then we enter into his rest. 
when we turn over all of our struggles, all of the things that, that cause us worry, the things that are weighing heavy on our shoulders right now, when we turn those over to him, when we come to Jesus, when we disciple ourselves to him, then we enter into his rest. And the takeaway simply this morning is that discipleship to Jesus leads to rest for your soul. We have to remember this morning that discipleship to Jesus leads to rest for your soul. Um, for me, this looked like in 2003. Um, again, I, I was hurting. I was tired. I was weary. And I hope, Mom and Dad, you guys remember this, but I remember that summer sitting on, on, the, uh, on the counter in the kitchen. I don't know what led to the breaking point, but I knew I could not go on living the way I was living anymore. Jesus was calling me, surely. Um, I knew that I was doing the wrong things, and I just sat on that counter, and I confessed to my parents that morning or that, that afternoon or whatever it was. I just poured my heart out. Um, they wept with me. We met with our interim youth pastor at the time. We read scripture together. It was at that point in my life I rededicated my life to Christ. It wasn't easy. It wasn't perfect from then on out. It wasn't just rainbows and fairy tales for the rest of my life. But I knew peace because I knew Jesus. I knew rest because I knew Jesus. I had hope because my hope was found in Jesus. And that's what we're asking you this morning, to come to Jesus, to find his peace, to find his rest. So first of all, our application today, first, simply come to Jesus. Again, if this is the only thing you hear this morning, leave behind the ways of this world. Leave behind your worries, your doubts, your fears. Leave behind legalism. Leave behind license and come to Jesus this morning. Second, become a disciple of Jesus we're not disciples of political systems. We're not disciples of our favorite sports or sports team. We're not disciples of social justice. We're not disciples of America. We're not disciples of our spouse or family. We're not disciples of our churches. And we are not disciples of our pastors. We are disciples of Jesus. I pray that over this church, day in and day out, we disciple ourselves to Jesus himself. Another thing that I love about discipleship and about the, the whole idea of a yoke is the yoke is put on. We can work more effectively with that yoke. Our, the yoke is Jesus, but it also has the connotation that many times yoke was put on multiple animals to be able to yoke them together to do more work more effectively. And I love that because at the church, that is what we do together as believers when we are discipled under Jesus and we have his yoke on us, we work together more effectively and we work together toward a common goal. That goal is found in Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus says to his followers, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you until the end of the age. That mission that we work together is the mission to reach the world with the truth of Jesus and to work together as believers to obey his commands. And the way that we say that at Cross Community Church, and I hope that you, uh, you hear this, Jason said it at the beginning, is that our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. We do that together. We do that in community. And the best way... If you want to have a practical way to know if you are yoked to Jesus, if you are discipled to Jesus, is to live out the six practices of a disciple in your life, which are, one, to devote daily, which means to have a daily walk with Jesus where you read Scripture, where you pray, where you worship daily. To gather consistently, to take seriously the gathering of the believers, to worship together in, in, as a congregation um, to be together, to learn together, to be yoked together for one purpose, to serve faithfully, to know that God has gifted each and every one of you with gifts that are specific to you, and he has gifted those gifts to you to be used for the church and to be used to accomplish his will in this world. Uh, fifth is to commit to community, to know that we are yoked together, and oftentimes we need our, our brothers and our sisters in the faith to encourage us. And your brothers and sisters in the faith need you to encourage them. 
And last, to engage missionally. To know that our, our hope is in heaven that we don't just become saved so that now we're saved, we're good to go, um, and we just live our lives as if we, uh, just like everyone else for the rest of the time. No, we are saved. Jesus has saved us, and now he has given us a commission to go into the world and to share the light that we have found in Christ Jesus, to share that light with the world, to share with people that are broken and weary. And let me tell you, there is no shortage of broken and weary people in our world right now. The six practices are concrete ways that we can be assured that we are yoked to Jesus. And the last thing to do this morning simply is to find rest in Jesus. What do you really want out of life? I mean, even if you take Jesus out of the equation for a minute, what do, you, what do people want out of life? Do they not want contentment? Do they not really want peace? And is it not one of the central teachings of the Christian faith that the only source of contentment, the only source of peace is found in Jesus himself? Is it not found in Galatians chapter 5 that as the Spirit works in us, that we get the things that we have desired in the first place? The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm not a genius. I just remember a song I learned in youth about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, but as, as we work together as believers, as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life, we get those beautiful things as fruit in our own lives. But it only comes if we come to Jesus, if we are yoked to him, and if we find our rest that is in Jesus. He is the source. Um, the last thing when we talk about finding rest is for something that has been long forgotten in the, in the American culture, which is to practice Sabbath in, in your life. What I mean by Sabbath is find a time weekly where you can relax, and whatever that looks like for you. I know that for everyone that's different, but for me, I'm an introverted person. It doesn't always happen the way I want it to happen. Um, it doesn't happen every week, every time, but to, to the best of our ability— um, we try to find one day a week where we say, you know what, we're just going gonna to hang out at home. We're not going anywhere. I'm not going to run errands. Um, I'm not going over to my family's house or my in-law's house. They're not coming over here. We're just going to rest. If I want to mow, I can mow if I find that restful. Um, I do like to mow. But um, general, generally the idea is just to relax, to recharge. I know for everyone, for some of y'all, that sounds like hell on earth, and I understand that. Um, but for some of you that are extroverts, maybe you need to be out, and that's okay. But listen, we need to find ways to Sabbath weekly, if at all possible, to find rest, which is so contrary to, to America, but absolutely necessary in the lives of believers. We're called to Sabbath. Um, I don't know. I thought, in a way, this was a a little bit of a softball of, of a message for Christians um, to just be encouraged to come to Jesus. But yet, here I am preaching, and there seems to be no lack of weariness, even in the lives of believers. And so my prayer for Cross Community this morning is that we're reminded of Jesus, that we come to him because he is good, because he is worthy, because he, um, because he can do all the things in Scripture that he's talked about. He can perform those things in our lives. I pray that we disciple ourselves and put on the yoke of Jesus. Yes, it's work, but it's work that is good. It is work that is light, that is bearable. It is work that is worth it. And that we find our rest in Christ Jesus. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much this morning. I thank you that we can take a time to be reminded of our faith, to be reminded to come to you. And Jesus, I pray that, I don't know, I, I pray that we find our rest in you, that we come to you this morning. God, whatever burdens us, I pray that we lay it aside. Whatever we think that you can't take care of, God, I pray that we act in faith, that we trust you. Father, I, I pray that day by day we would walk with you, that you would uh, lead us into a better path. Jesus, I pray that we disciple ourselves to you day by day. 
And I pray that the blessing over Cross Community Church that you bring us rest. Father, would you use us this week? Would you work in us this week? And God, we pray these things in your holy name. Amen.